us off at pathogens. Okay, let's start there. Um, let's start there. So let me uh, share my screen here. All right. So pathogenic bacteria, go ahead and take a look at that slide while I write a reminder to set up your lecture exam Wednesday. Let's see. So um, I do want you to know what a pathogen is, just kind of the, the definition. Um, so it's basically a microorganism, unless we're talking about a virus. So really an infectious agent, because viruses aren't considered living, they're not considered organisms, uh, that causes disease in its host, right? Uh, so that's a pathogen. That's what it means to be pathogenic. So if I ask you on the exam, hey, what's, what does it mean to be pathogenic? What's a pathogen? Causes disease, disease. Um, a lot of pathogenic bacteria, for those who are going to go into the medical healthcare field, um, you know, in a sort of, uh, um, Getting the word not civilized, but in a uh, first world country, I think would be the proper term. Uh, something place like the United States, these things aren't too common because we have uh, you know superb um, water sanitation and uh, health, sort of um, you know with nutrition and diet with our grocery stores and all this stuff but in other places in the world that you know nutritionally you can't go to a market and get things with healthy uh vitamins and minerals for your immune system and you're malnourished you're not eating um the water is contaminated because there's no uh treatment uh the infrastructure isn't established these things are pretty common they're rampant um, so, however, they, they are present, they do happen. You, some of you may have got strep throat before, um, but things like tuberculosis, it's very interesting. Um, what, what do you think the, when you go to a hospital in the United States or a doctor's office, what, what do you think are the kinds of things they're seeing more frequently? They don't really see tuberculosis much. It's a very deadly thing, and it's it's not very common unless you're, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, impoverished people who are not sleeping. They're, you know, not sanitized. They're chronically exposed and malnourished. Um, but what do you think, like a doctor? Uh, like my dad, even he's a doctor. He, what, do you, what kind of patients do you think he sees in the United States? It's like the most frequent types of conditions in this country. Yeah, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, ab absolutely, and stroke, um, diabetes, uh, cancer. Anything else? Um, autoimmune diseases, so things like arthritis and Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, things like that. But um, yeah, so these infectious type diseases aren't too common, except well, if you consider COVID, you know, is uh, sadly right. I want to make light of it, so it's you know, um, uh, pandemic. So microbiology is getting some notoriety lately which doesn't happen very often.
but I always like to talk about this because it's very interesting to me that uh, the number one deadliest disease on the planet, the thing that kills the most human beings on earth is tuberculosis caused by the bacterium, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, but in the United States, again, it's, it's at, towards the bottom of the list. Um, so it's very, very interesting in that regard, the sort of differences, right? But this is all bacterial, right? Bacteria, bacterial diseases. Uh, and here are some other notable examples you may have heard of. Um, let's talk about antibiotics. So antibiotics are sort of the revolutionary drug that changed the world when it was first discovered, uh, mostly because, um, you know, during wartime, you know, this is, you have like open wounds, the technology wasn't so great. So sterilization of surgical instruments and all these things. So infection was much more common, these types of bacterial infections. Uh, and antibiotics wiped them out. They were incredibly effective at killing bacterial cells. Uh, and the way that they do this So these antibiotics, penicillin, methicillin, they're competitive inhibitors, which might ring a bell because we talked about um, enzymes and regulation of enzymes uh, in a previous unit. And we talked about these competitive inhibitor molecules that compete for the active site. So the key here is that uh, antibiotics like penicillin uh, inhibit a crucial enzyme present in bacteria. And it's an enzyme called transpeptidase. You don't have to know that, but it is the enzyme responsible. Oh, I don't have the rest of the, can I edit it? <laughs> here we go. Um, the cell wall. So who remembers what the cell wall is made of in bacteria? Remember, we plant cells have cell walls, but they're made of cellulose. Bacterial cells have cell walls, but they're made of something else, different type of uh, substance. Not glucose. Uh, that's not right. It's okay. I mean, sugar, right? Um, actually, let me think. No, there's there's some sugar type groups in this structure. Cellulose was a polysaccharide, so. And it actually, cellulose in plant cell walls is a bunch of glucoses linked together. You're welcome. <laughs> so you're not technically wrong when it comes to the plant cell walls. But anyway, it's called peptidoglycan. That's what these the bacterial cell walls are made of. Uh, so that was back here peptidoglycan. So you might want to know that. Pretty sure I asked about that, I think. But yes, that's, uh, that's what these uh, cell walls are made of. And this enzyme that is uh, inhibited by antibiotics builds these peptidoglycan cell walls in bacteria that newly dividing bacteria, forming new bacteria, new cell walls. So they can't. And it ultimately really, re, it results in the death of the bacterial cells and that um, they can't divide and reproduce. Now, we're about to get into viruses. And importantly, if I have a viral infection, 
a doctor will not give me uh, penicillin or any antibiotic. They don't work against viruses. They don't have a cell wall. So they only work against bacteria, antibiotic, a, a living thing. As we'll see on the next slide and when we talk about viruses, um, officially, the scientific community does not consider viruses as living. And we'll, we'll talk about why. Any questions before I begin discussing viruses? Okay. What the heck is a virus? Anyone know? <laughs> well, a virus is an infectious particle. It's a particle extremely small. Um, and we're going to look at um, the actual structure of virus, viral particles or virions, they're sometimes known as. Um, in a moment, but um, they're non-living. And the key reason for this is that they cannot reproduce by themselves. They, can't, they need a host in order to make more copies of themselves. Uh, and at the fundamental level, this violates something that all life on the planet possesses in this characteristic that um, uh, all cells can divide and reproduce and make more cells. Um, so viruses kind of, as we'll see what in their life cycle, they sort of hijack host cells. They take them over and they actually um, hijack the host cell machinery, as we say. They basically steal it or borrow. They, they use it. All of our ways of reproducing, which includes protein synthesis, DNA replication, et cetera, or RNA if it's an RNA virus. But we're going to talk about this. I just want you to know that that's, they can't reproduce by themselves. Um, so it's kind of, you know, science, and you know, it gets sort of philosophical. Some some people and scientists included think viruses are living. They have genetic material. They have DNA or RNA. Um, they um, can adapt. They change. They mutate. They have some characteristics that life has, but really. Um, officially, they're non. -living. Now, um, that you know. So the the other thing is they're not made of cells. They're not a cell at all. We'll see that shortly. They don't have a phospholipid bilayer membrane. They don't have that. Um, everything else on the planet does. It, it's either a cell or it's more than one cell. Uh, but yeah, so viruses are kind of kind of weird, and. They're ancient, man. They're ancient. They they they've been around since bacteria, billions of years. Um, and just just to kind of go back to this slide, I do I don't want to forget to show you. They're so small. Viruses are so small that you need an electron microscope to see them. Uh, these are fancy two hundred thousand dollar microscopes that you might find at like a higher up like research institution like UCSD, SDSU might have one. Um, you know, so, you know, virologists, they're, they're using electron microscopes um, and they usually have like a core facility where everyone uses, uses it. Um, and so in contrast, no, now I know I said bacteria are tiny. They are, I showed you, they're tiny. 
Um, and that's a high power magnification, but uh, viruses are like a, what would that conversion be? That's a thousand, a tenth. So they're like the tenth, a tenth the size of the bacterial cell. Um, is that right? Like one micro. Yeah, I think so. Wait, let me double check. I have to, I have to, I'm not good with the units thing. That's why I don't teach math or anything. Uh, calculator. Actually, why don't I ask Siri? Hey, Siri, how many nanometers is one micrometer? One micrometer is 1,000 nanometers. Thanks, Siri. Um, I thought so. All right, so it's a tenth, tenth the size. Um, and they, you know, in this range. So very small, very small, which is part of why I don't like uh, agree with all of the regulations as much with COVID. Because um, I really think these things are inescapable. Mass reduce the viral load, the amount of particles that someone emits. Uh, but there's no science to, to uh, show that you need a high viral load in order to be uh, infected. So anyway, I won't get into that. <laughs> I'll get too uh, ramped up. <laughs> but um, here's some examples of some common, not common, but well-known viruses that you may have heard of. Uh, herpes virus. HIV, cause of the AIDS, coronavirus, which I'm sure none of you have heard of, none. And who knows what that is, what is that? <laughs> rhinovirus, so if you had a common cold before, then it was a different coronavirus or a rhinovirus. Um, papillomavirus, cervical cancer, pox, chicken pox, shingles, um, smallpox as well as a different uh, strain, I think. Anyway, um, hepatitis, it's a liver in, uh, infection. Epstein-Barr causes mononucleosis, Ebola. Ebola is really deadly virus um, and it's sort of uh, an issue in uh, African countries, certain African areas. Influenza causes the flu. Polio virus causes polio, and Zika um, has been known to cause birth defects and stuff like that. But yeah, just some probably heard of these, and they're viral. Antibiotics won't work against any of these. Okay, questions so far? I don't have too much left, but any any questions so far? All right. So what? So viruses, if they're not cells, they're not living, what the heck are they? Well, they're protein capsules. And the, the outer shell of the uh, Vira, uh, viral particle is made is called a capsid, a protein capsid, and they all uh, they often have these really interesting geometric shapes. So, like if you look here on my next slide here, here's a capsid, and it looks like this um, multi-sided sort of diamond-looking thing called an icosahedron. Um, that's the name of that type of shape it has. Um, but uh, the key here is they're, they're very simple. They, they, they're just protein filled with DNA or RNA. So some of viruses have RNA, some have DNA. Certain, that depends on the virus. So herpes virus, you know, might have DNA or um, HIV is DNA based. And then like, I think uh, coronavirus might be RNA. But anyways, uh, so, and then there are some 
that in addition to the protein capsid, they have a membrane surrounding them. So when I said there's no membrane, I, I take that back. But um, <laughs> it's not a cell. It's not a cell. A cell has fluid, it has cytoplasm, it has ribosomes, it has um, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not, not necessarily the same thing. Um, and, and the cells, you know, they have a ton of molecules in the cytoplasm in order to build uh, structures uh, like nucleotides, monomers, right? But uh, the viruses, like I said, they, they steal everything. And I'll show you what I mean by that uh, soon. And yes, I already emphasized, they're very tiny, right? And they require this fancy high-powered microscope. So here are the main two categories of viruses. Again, you can have this naked virus that has no envelope. And then there are also enveloped viruses, I believe herpes virus is enveloped to review a lot of my virology stuff. Once I teach micro, it'll kind of come back, but. Um, so enveloped viruses have this phospholipid membrane surrounding the virus. Um, and it, interestingly enough, it's not their own. Um, when viruses reproduce, they actually, some of them, right, the enveloped ones, um, they actually steal some of of the membrane from the cell they infect. So that's probably partly why they're considered non-living. Uh, most of their stuff, they just kind of take from us or other cells. Am I teaching micro at Grossmont? I am not. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing yet. Um, I'm, I'm probably gonna do one more semester of intro bio uh, before I take on micro. I think micro is like another level of a lot of challenges and understanding and it'll take a lot of work for me. So I'm kind of probably just need one more semester before I'm ready to take that on. Um, plus I'd wanna do it in person and I'm not, I don't know the situation yet. And I'll probably just wait until this all blows over and goes away, you know, um, and we're back on campus without the restriction stuff. Um, but yeah, so, uh, okay, cool. Never going away completely. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of lasting, uh, input, you know, uh, effects. But, you know, try to move on, right? Viral life cycle. Okay, so bacteria divide, right? They divide just like our cells do by a very similar process to mitosis called binary fission. Um, you don't have to know that. But viruses do something different. How do they reproduce? Well, first of all, they infect one very specific cell type. We call this having a very narrow host range. Um, for example, HIV only infects a very specific type of T cell called a T helper cell. Um, and coronaviruses, flu viruses can only uh, attach and buy or and infect the cells that line um, the respiratory tract. Uh, these are uh, cells that line the lungs, the trachea, bronchi. I have to review my anatomy of when it starts to become uh, a different cell. <laughs> Anyways, um, you don't have to know that. You just have to know it's very one spe specific cell type, right? Um, like I can't have... Um, a like the coronavirus COVID it can't uh, infect my liver cells, for example, like hepatitis virus does. So let's look at how 
let's look at how these guys, what they're doing, how they're reproducing uh, using our cells. So the general idea is that they're going to bind to the outer surface of a host cell, as you can see with the attachment, and attach uh, typically to a membrane receptor, protein membrane receptor, sort of fools the cell into thinking, oh, this is a nutrient or this is a amino acid I need to bring it in. And then it brings it in, entry. Um, and as soon as the virus enters, the capsid disassembles. There are protease enzymes that kind of break it down in the cell. Uh, and these, this, it's kind of like a Trojan horse. You know, the Trojan horse is like, um, it disguises, what's that story? So they, the, the big horse presented as like a, a present or a gift to this empire, uh, but all the soldiers are inside. So they bring it in so they can get past the castle wall. Um, but then all of a sudden, boom, they come out and kill everyone. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, so once the capsid disassembles, um, the viral genome is released. So the complete set of viral DNA or RNA, in this case, viral RNA. Um, and so two things really happen here. The genome gets replicated so that there are more uh, uh, copies of that genome, similar to DNA replication in our cells, although we just make uh, two copies when we do two cells, but they'll make uh, millions here because millions of new viruses are going to be made. So they all, but what they also do is synthesize viral proteins, but they do it using our ribosomes, our amino acids in constructing proteins that we got from our diet or we, the cell has for our, making our own proteins and our own ribosomes. So they hijack the host cell machinery. So that viral RNA is being translated at the ribosome to produce viral proteins, uh, namely a, the capsid, the protein capsid, more of them to, and they assemble by um, the genome and the, ca the capsid will um, cover the genome. So it assembles in the structure of the virus. Uh, and then really there's kind of this viral lysis that occurs when it's released. And viral lysis, um, essentially what's going on here, um, let me, the viruses produce so many new particles in this way that the cell is just gonna swell up and get big, kind of like if you get a water balloon and fill it with water and you keep filling and filling until it gets so big it just bursts. It's kind of what happens. And as soon as it bursts, the, all of these brand, lean, brand new viral particles are going to explode out of that cell and go off to infect more new cells and do the same thing. They kind of spread like wildfire. Um, in the case of an enveloped virus, to get new envelopes, what they'll do is they actually um, bud off of the membrane. So they do this kind of thing. So it's very bad drawing, but here's my cell. And it's going to be released from the cell by taking part of the membrane. So it'll pinch off and release, and it takes part of that cell membrane. So the cell membrane gets kind of shorter. Um, what this actually does though, it does it in such a crude, quick way, it tears the membrane and it ruptures it. 
and it sort of releases all the cell content and the cell dies. So this obviously kills the host cell and why, that's why it's a problem, right? Um, okay. So that's it on viruses. That's sort of the very general intro to viruses. In micro, you spend about uh, a week talking about viruses. You kind of go into the molecular mechanisms involved in, you know, uh, HIV or um, the flu. Kind of what what's going on, what kind of proteins they're making in addition to their capsid, things like that. I sure can. Yeah. I got this from Khan Academy. I think this was a cool picture. I'll leave it up for another another minute just in case anyone's like redrawing everything. Um, and all we have are a few slides on immunology. Like I said, I plan to finish early today. So, you know, you guys have been really persistent. Um, resilient to watch all of these lectures online. So. Okay. Um, that slide's also on Canvas too. Um, but yeah, let's finish up. We've got immunology left. So this is the, basically the area of how we fight these bastards. <laughs> Excuse my language. But how are we gonna defend ourselves against these really deadly, awful pathogens? And it's called the immune system. It's called our white blood cells. So we're gonna talk a little bit about innate versus adaptive immunity. Uh, and this is gonna consist of our white blood cells. So the blood cells that are circulating in our vasculature, the veins and arteries of our body, in addition to our red blood cells. Um, so they're technically called leukocytes. Okay, so before we get into innate immunity, let me just say, um, so uh, so in the blood, we have mostly red blood cells. Now the red blood cells are carrying oxygen to our tissues. So the Blood vessels, arteries, veins, capillaries, uh, these are uh, highway, they're kind of like highway systems to deliver oxygen to all of our organs and uh, muscle tissue, skin, um, brain, so that we 
can live and make energy with the oxygen as we learned in cellular respiration, why we need oxygen. Um, now, let's see. Um, in addition to these red blood cells, for every like maybe five or 10, there's a white blood cell and they look vastly different. And we'll see a picture of kind of how they look. But these are our defense cells. These are the cells that fight infection or prevent it. Um, technical term, these are leukocytes. Um, and we have a, ver a variety of different types of them. Um, and we call the white blood cells, we call the sort of our defense system, the immune system. Uh, this is immunology. And there's really two branches. There's the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system uh, consists of a few different cell types. And so we take a look here. Uh, innate white blood cells are cells that we're born with. So they're fighting infection and they're helping us from day one, from as soon as we're born. And some types of cells that are part of the innate immune system are neutrophils, macrophages, eosinophils, basophils, mast cells, dendritic cells. Um, they all have vary in the different mechanisms of how they kill bacteria and viruses. But um, the general idea that I want you to know are these cell types, of course. So if I were to ask like, okay, is, which of the following is an innate immune cell, uh, you'd want to the answer would be a neutrophil or a macrophage, whatever else is listed here. Um, innate immune cells are nonspecific. So for example, a macrophage will target staph, it'll target strep uh, pyogenes, it'll target Neisseria gonorrhea, it'll target a whole host of bacteria and viruses, um, different bacterial species, viral strains, um, because they all have these common molecular patterns. So bacteria, they have these very unique structures on the cell surface. They have peptidoglycan, for example. We don't have that. Uh, our cells don't have that. So these cells kind of, they'll see these patterns and they treat them as foreign. They know it's an invader and they know to kill it. <laughs> um, but the, the point here is, again, that, that these cells are nonspecific. They target a whole host of different viruses and bacterial pathogens for destruction. Now, the adaptive immune system, on the other hand, we aren't born with these cells. Well, we are, but they're not ready to go. They need to be primed. They need to be trained up. And the way this happens, if you've ever been sick and had a fever and swollen lymph nodes, and this is your immune response. This is triggering your adaptive immune response. And so when you have a bacterial infection or a cold, a, a flu virus, um, that's starting to, you know, the innate immune system isn't enough to get rid of it. Adaptive immunity comes into play. And essentially, through a whole cascade of events, um, B cells and T cells are going to be activated. When they're activated, they are sort of like the, um, the highly trained, specialized Navy SEAL type cells. Um, versus the innate immune cells, they're kind of like the infantry, they're the ground troops, but the, the trained soldiers, it's kind of, I, I like to have fun with the analogies, but what really happens, I kid you not, in the body, and you'll learn this in detail when you take immunology or microbiology, um, a cell is going to, a certain cell, dendritic cell, is going to travel to the lymph node where these B cells and T cells chill out. They're just chilling there. 
And they actually have a piece of the enemy, a piece, a molecular um, uh, molecule, a molecule, peptide, protein, whatever. They have a piece of that bacteria or virus and they show it to the B cells and the T cells. And they say, this is what we're looking for. And once that happens, um, they start, the B cells and the T cells start dividing like crazy, which we call proliferate. They proliferate rapidly. And the B cells, what they do is they pump out antibodies. So that's their role. And antibody, oops, too far, darn it. So again, a lot of mechanisms involved, but antibodies are these proteins that B cells just pump out and they can attach and bind to these bacteria, kind of like homing missiles. They, they um, stick to them and target them for destruction, essentially. Now, T cells um, do um, a different type of destruction. Um, there are cytotoxic T cells. They're going to, um, uh, it's very interesting, but sometimes our cells, if they're infected with one of these viruses that is entered inside, the, the virus or the cell can present it on its surface, a piece of that virus and say, hey, I'm infected. I need to go. <laughs> you got to take me out. It's kind of like a martyr. Like, hey, look, um, a virus has infected me check it out. And the T cell will find it and say, oh, okay, and kill that cell before the virus can reproduce or spread. Pretty, pretty crazy. Now, the other thing I want you to know about the adaptive immune system, in contrast to the innate, it's specific. So a B cell that's activated is going to produce antibodies that only bind to the target uh, antigen we call it, or the target pathogen, really, um, and nothing else. It's highly specific uh, against the virus or bacteria that's taking over. Um, same thing with the T cells. T cell receptors are very specific against whatever the, um, you know, the, the example I was going to say, like, you know, when they took out, um, when they killed bin Laden or when they, you know, hunted down some, you know, killer, I don't know, um, drug cartel person, you know, they show the, the Navy SEALs, they show them the picture, right? Or the, and their, their mission is just to get to that guy, right? They might kill a few others on the way, but <laughs> not really, not, not in the immune system. Um, so it's against this, it's like, and that's actually what happens. The, the cells travel to the lymph node with a piece and say, hey, this is the guy. <laughs> and then the, the adaptive immune system and the B cells, T cells, they're like, okay, let's go get them. <laughs> and they do, and they wipe it out. Um, so anyway, here's what they look like. Um, erythrocyte, that's the fancy word for a red blood cell. but here are your innate immune cells, the lymphocytes, those are your adaptive. So there's B lymphocyte and T lymphocytes. That's what they look like. Um, they kind of look a little smaller with a giant nucleus. Um, and I think the last thing I wanna show you, oh, just kidding, yeah, is this mechanism. Um, so I keep saying, okay, these white blood cells are good at killing cells that are infected by viruses. They can also kill um, bacterial cells, right? Um, and it's a really amazing mechanism called phagocytosis. And it's like the main uh, common mechanism that macrophages use. Neutrophils, I think, can do it as well. But um, it's a cool video, and I'll kind of describe what it is. But um, 
Hold on, let me. So Gina, that's a great question. So what happens, I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, that is what happens. It's exactly what happens. A vaccine is that component, that part of the pathogen that is introduced into the blood and it gets presented to your adaptive immune cells. And the reason this is um, part of your adaptive immunity, part of when you get sick and you get this response, um, and the B and T cells are getting fired up. Um, they start dividing like crazy, right? Like I mentioned, and getting ready to circulate and find these guys. But a certain subpopulation of them are called memory B cells, memory T cells, and they stick around. They stick around in the case that you get infected again. And so that's the, the point of a vaccination is when it happens, you get these memory cells generated. And so if you then later get exposed to the coronavirus, well, you already have these memory cells ready to go take it out so it doesn't kill you or you can't spread it, et cetera. That's the idea behind it. So yes, it, a vaccine is a way to manipulate your own natural immune response. It's pretty amazing. Um, so let's see. Um, so, Last thing I want to say before we end here is uh, what phagocytosis is. It's just the, the main mechanism for how uh, certain innate white blood cells destroy pathogens. Um, and so uh, essentially what phagocytosis is, is the white blood cell, like the macrophage. By the way, you might wanna know that for the exam. If I ask, what's the white blood cell that most commonly performs phag phagocytosis? Um, macrophage. Um, and so the macrophage is circulating in our blood, right, constantly. We even have some in the lungs, alveolar macrophage. And when it sees bacterial cells, much smaller, right? Um, it actually extends out its cytoplasm, surrounds it, and engulfs the bacterial cell. Pretty much eats it, takes it in. When it does that, the bacterial cell is enclosed in what's called a phagosome. Uh, and then that phagosome, which is kind of like a, it's a vesicle that contains the bacteria, fuses with the lysosome of the macrophage. So what does a lysosome do? Who remembers what that organelle does? Mitochondria, right, would produce energy. Uh, Golgi complex, these are organelles. So what is a, yes, breaks down, good enough. I love it. So lysosomes specialize in, they're packed with these digestive enzymes that break down molecules. Um, could be food particle, molecule, whatever it is. Um, and so the bacterial cells get degraded. They get broken down um, when this lysosome and the phagosome fuse and destroy. So I really like to show this video. It's very short because it's just a cool, they actually have this happening in real time. They show you. Um, so let me get, uh, and it's the last thing that we talk about. So we'll be done by five. Uh, internet.
While I'm pulling this up, are there any questions before I show you phagocytosis in real time? Come on. The email, oh, uh, I would look at the syllabus for that. I think that's the best, because it has the chapters and it has um, uh, four. Uh, so it's everything after unit three that'll be on the exam. It's not like a comprehensive final or anything. Um, so I think if I'm not mistaken, it's genetics, uh, molecular biology, and this these lectures on bacteria, viruses, immunology. Um, don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure that's, those are the, oh. Pause. Might be like freaking out some broadcasting people. Um, oh, Jeannie, thank you. Send me a DM. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. I'm I'm really glad to hear it because I, um, I always wanted a professor to make this biology stuff easy to understand, and it was really. It never happened. So once I, you know, figured things out, I really wanted to help people get this stuff. It's not easy. Um, and Rita, to answer your uh, question, uh, the study guide um, will be worth the three points uh, as usual, yeah. Um, and didn't I say that I was gonna offer an extra credit activity this week because there's no lab? Oh, I didn't talk about the lab alternate assignment. I know some of you um, had difficulty with the lab. Oh, thanks, Maureen. Um, oh, I'm gonna blush. <laughs> um, the lab, so I have that alternate assignment, right? For the lab, if you couldn't access the Darwinian thing snails um so that is due friday it's just a different lab of sorts it's just you know i asked you to in the email it's it's there um but i do remember saying that because there's no lab per se this week that i would give an extra credit opportunity so i'm going to send that out tonight um so if you're interested I'll, uh, I'll be doing that. But yeah, to end things, let us take a look at phagocytosis. You remember now, yeah, yeah, I'll send it out today in my email, um, what it is. Okay, I hope I can make it. Okay, check it out.
Ta-da. All right, that's it. All right, any final questions? Um, that was really cool. Yeah, I know, I know. It's crazy. Can you believe that's happening all the time in your blood? All the time. Yeah, macrophages also enter your tissues and that uh, they leave the blood vascular arteries and they enter your tissues to, even the music was cool. <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, you know, the white blood cells and the fact that we evolved this ability to defend ourselves because bacteria have been here for billions of years. Um, and you know, if you, if you don't have an immune system, you die. These things, they'll be able to take you over. Um, you know, so it's pretty, pretty incredible stuff. All right. Well, um, if anything comes up, please email. Um, and uh, that's it, though. I really enjoyed teaching you guys. Uh, Wednesday, I have a review session, optional review session for lecture four exam and then the lab exam as well. So, yeah, it'll be at 4 p.m., same time as uh, normal. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll see you or not Wednesday. Good luck on your exams. <laughs>